February? <laughs> right. Still January, folks. Sorry, Ted Ralston here. Friday afternoon, uh, downtown Honolulu, where the drone leads, our, our weekly show on Think Tech Hawaii, where we bring you the latest news and latest uh, opinions and um, information on this very important subject. Uh, where the drone leads. Today, joining us on our show all the way from Washington, D.C., which is probably not here in Hawaii, is uh, Chuck Devaney. Chuck, uh, welcome on board again. Thanks for having me on the show, Ted. Yeah, yeah, and you, you, you found yourself a Aloha shirt in Washington, D.C. That's pretty cool. Yep, yep. Okay. Chuck was probably our first guest on this show three years ago, or thereabouts, uh, and has been on several times since, but uh, we lost him from the Hawaii enclaves to those of the halls of Washington, D.C. We're going to get you back sometime, Chuck? Um, that could only be a dream at this point, Ted, but, uh, you know, if, uh, if there is an opportunity, I would definitely consider it. Okay. How about the, the, uh, the uh, GSA conference in, um, in May? Are you coming out for that? Um, actually, I'm probably not going to make that. Um, I've got oh, uh, okay. another engagement that has uh, arisen, um, something that started, you know, um, a little less than nine months ago. Okay. So around that time, I think my time will be pretty much here. So I, I, um, probably I, not. But I, I got uh, your you're picture. slated to speak. Okay. So uh, uh, things are changing, and that's, that's all good, all for the good. Um, yeah. And just in case people don't realize or recognize what that picture in the background is here in our studio, that's actually a close-up taken from a, a dash cam uh, in, a, in a Super Cub PA-18 uh, during a landing uh, into a very complex environment. And that, that uh, V angle there is the old V strut for all people who fly PA-18s or J-3s or even uh, 7ACs will recognize the V strut. And that's a close-up from a, a dash cam. Anyway. Uh, Chuck, uh, we got on the table here one of our favorite subjects, a, uh, a, a UAS that you and I have been working on together for three or four years now, and um, things have gone a long way, Chuck, since we first met over this very exact object here on the table, which is a Gatewing professional mapper. I think Gatewing's gone beyond this to a higher level of systems, and Trimble bought them, and it's a lot of motion in the business, a lot of motion in technology. And you've taken your experience at UH, where you were using unmanned air systems, UAVs, or drones to do beach erosion mapping and such, and you've moved off to Washington, D.C., where a whole different world. Tell us what it's been like, Chuck. What have you learned that's different? Where do you see things going from your new perspective? Well, Ted, why it's, why it's different for me now, it's, you know, it's interesting. So I, I was using and applying UAS to a specific problem, and in, in this case, um, uh, accuracy of ortho imagery in denied environments. So kind of after all the work that we did in the Philippines, it kind of brought me to want to do like disaster mapping and beach erosion. Um, of course, we did a lot of different work for a lot of different disciplines. Um, also Army Natural Resources at the top of uh, Kahanaiki, um, the back of Makua Valley. So we had the opportunity to do a lot of work and a lot of mapping. But ever since I came to the DC area, I haven't been doing a whole lot of mapping. I've been doing some flying, but it's been predominantly building airplanes for for people. So in during the time, and and I think that you can remember this. You told me if 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 I wanted to go to the Philippines, I had to have the same competency as I am to be able to build these things, so I could be more effective in the field. Well, I I, I took that to heart, and I just locked myself in that lab in physical science for however long it took me, but that kind of put me in a position where um, I was able to build the aircraft, the open source stuff and, you know, the DJI stuff um, in both fixed wing and multi-rotor configurations. So I got here, people found out that, I, that that's what I could do. So that's what I've been doing. I've just been back in that lab stuck um, building airplanes. That's pretty cool, Chuck, and uh, a long way from the days in uh, the lab down here at UH. In fact, you and I had a conversation once in those labs about using inflatable structure, infl inflatable structural technology in order to make these things shippable to the Philippines or any other place uh, by rolling them up, letting the air out of them, roll them up, and then pump them up on site. Uh, we just came across uh, an operation up in Alaska that actually is using inflated structures these days, and we're working with them on how that might uh, translate into configurations that are useful in the sense of the conversation we had. So a lot of things have changed, a lot of things have moved forward. Um, 
uh, the world of, of sensors, the world of miniaturization, LIDAR is now down to what, a half a pound for a LIDAR? Uh, uh, about 800 grams, yeah. They, they might have them a little bit smaller, but you, you have to go really, really low and you have to go really slow and you only get one return. But there's, you know, if you want to get up into the, you know, more of the three pound range, you can get something that's pretty, pretty trick. So, and so things are, even in that short three years you've been involved here, it's been a lot of, uh, a lot of improvement in, in, in capability and improvement in technology, miniaturization, reliability, all those things have changed a lot. Have you ever seen in your own life uh, anything change as fast as what we've experienced here? Um, probably kind of about the 97, 98 range where everybody was trying to go as fast as possible to make the United States digital before Canada. Well, Canada beat us, but um, during that time is when you start, started to see the evolution of the cell phone. And so you started to see, you know, voiceover or you know, voicemail, then voiceover IP, stuff like that. So people were moving information, voice data, and data pretty quickly. And then this has been a complete and total eruption. You know, we have seen so much change and so many different technologies and disciplines and, and, and processes drive the technology and vice versa. Um, it's been kind of an exponential kind of crazy climb. So moving and, even faster than cell phones, right? Yeah. And, and literally moving faster than cell phones by aviating. But you know, that brings up another really interesting point that you and I were talking about uh, in recently uh, and have discussed before. Uh, that is the, the, just the way that this information can be distributed, can be assimilated by people, can be understood, how it fits their, their lifestyle, how it fits their values, how it fits uh, the threats against them and such. So this rapid evolution of technology that's kind of in your face is an, it requires a socialization, requires a community outreach, requires community involvement. So one thing that we've taken on here after realizing that, and uh, like to welcome you as, as part of that, is uh, for 2017, taking on the, kind of the mission of community involvement as the main necessary piece to evolve and push this technology forward and make it useful. Have you seen that sort of sentiment being played out in DC? Um, well, there's a DC drone users group here um, and uh, I think they have a lot of involvement, a lot of racers, but they're all, you know, kind of stuck inside the SFRA. So they've got to come outside. So in order to operate a drone, it's been, you know, a little bit in terms of like outreach outside of academia, that's pretty much been it. There's, there's, there's a, a lot of, um, there's a lot of racing going on. So I think that's getting a lot more uh, of the kids involved. And then, of course, the outreach from certain individuals and certain uh, institutions in STEM and STEAM programs at high schools. So, you know, take it out of the air, you know, minim you know, get rid of the whole FAA component and put a tether on it and stick it underwater. It's kind of the same sort of concept where you're, you know, taking the man out of the equation and, you know, teaching the kids. So I've actually been a part of a, a, a couple of those projects where we, we helped some 10th uh, some, uh, graders build a couple of ROVs. And uh, it, they, they put it together faster than I think we could have probably put it together. <laughs> I had an experience once. I was doing some work in, uh, in an N NSTA uh, uh, cage, flying instant eye inside a cage, doing obstacle avoidance and such as part of a human factors issue. They're looking at uh, the hand controller, the video of the of the actual uh, uh, bird, and then the obstacle clearance and all this, and they're judging performance based on your ability to sense what's going on from the, the ground controller. Uh, you know, I'm really old, and uh, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, the guy who ran the cage came over and said, let me try that. He's like, you know, 45 or 50, picked it up, and without much coaching, he's able to operate better than I was. And then a professor who was there uh, came by, this is University of Texas uh, in that system, and he said, look, my 12-year-old uh, grandson likes to fly these things. Would you mind showing him what you're doing? And I say, I just gave him the controller. The bird's flying, it's in the cage, gave the kid the controller, no lessons, no words at all. He's, he's making it hop around that cage uh, like there's no tomorrow. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, that happens. So anyway, that, yeah. that whole issue of uh, getting this technology accepted is, is really interesting. And we're, 
I wouldn't say we're facing that, but we're going to be taking that on as part of this Pan-Pacific Unmanned Air Systems Test Range Complex, the Hawaii component of the Alaska, Hawaii, Oregon, Mississippi, and Iceland uh, lash up. Um, so I, I'd like to ask you, though, on, on that same account, um, re realizing we have these, this, this sanctioned laboratory uh, concept of uh, a test range, uh, which is unlimited to, it's not limited to 107. The whole idea is to go beyond 107, which is the current uh, level of, of um, certification you can get, and examine and test and cause to fail and cause to succeed those things that go way, way, way beyond 107. Beyond line of sight, cluster operations, swarm operations, counter drone, and uh, operations at night over people and such. And beyond line of sight uh, doesn't mean just over the hill. It means operate the thing in, in, uh, in Hawaii with a ground station in Nebraska, for example, or something like that. So uh, again, uh, from your perspective and experience, what you picked up in DC, how would you see the missions that would be important for this kind of a FAA test range uh, to take on? What would those missions be? Um, well, one that comes to mind relatively quickly would be uh, a large airship to carry cargo across the Pacific. What a great test area to be able to do that because it's very sparsely populated. And so that um, would be an unmanned? Air yeah. Interesting. Okay. It'd be an airship. It would travel slow. It'd probably travel roughly the same um, speed as a, an actual you know, freighter and um, probably consume less energy and um, and carry you know a, a comparable payload. So that's one thing that kind of pops in my head that would be quick and easy and something that the you know it's it's not doesn't carry any ordinance. It's helping the environment. That would help people understand that um, uh, you know those that are at least having a hard time uh, dealing with it and kind of change the whole national and international conversation about the topic. That certainly um, would. That would be a long range, uh, lighter than air transportation system. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and it's got lift. You know, it's not like a multi rotor that's got a bunch of sp scary spinning blades and, you know, horrible endurance. You know, we're talking about something that would have a forward flight component and, um, you know, use, I don't, I don't know what they would use in terms of gas. I know we're getting really, really short on helium, but um, perhaps there's an, an, another lighter than air alternative. So that would be something if that could get worked out. And I know that it's being worked out. Um, somebody just sent me a link to a company that's been working with NASA in, in, in this in, in carrying, um, you know, something the size of a container. Well, could you just scale it so it could take several containers perhaps, um, who knows? And then also, uh, search and rescue, um, swarm search and rescue, you know, multiple units out working with each other to completely blanket and map the, the ocean surface, looking for temperature differences, things floating in the water after a crash. That could probably be very quickly, quickly deployed if it's not already airborne at 50, 60, 70,000 feet, because you don't got to worry about a lot of, you know, keeping a pilot conscious. <laughs> Um, in an, an aircraft, so that's going to take the that's going to take the cooperation of a lot of a lot of different parts let's, and links. Let's, let's hold that, that the cooperation word is really important here. Let's just uh, hold that thought for a moment and take our first break. And go back and deliver and uh, del <laughs> develop more of that concept of cooperation at that scale. Got it. Aloha, this is Kaylee Aquino with the weekly Ehana Kako. Let's work together program on the ThinkTech Hawaii broadcast network, Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. Movers and shakers and great ideas. Join us. We'll see you then. Aloha. Thank you for watching Think Tech. I'm Grace Chang, the new host for Global Connections. You can find me here live every Thursday at 1 p.m. where we'll be talking to people around the islands or visiting the islands who are connected in various aspects of global affairs. So please tune in and aloha and thanks for watching. Aloha, my name is Richard Emery and I host Condo Insider. We talk about issues facing the Condo Association throughout Hawaii and talk about solutions. When you think about it, about one third of our population lives in some form of common interest real estate. We broadcast every Thursday at 3 p.m. Please tune in. Tune in and thank you. Aloha.
We're back here, folks. Ted Ralston and our guest, uh, Chuck Devaney, uh, in Washington, D.C. We're having a 6,000-mile Skype version of uh, Think Tech Hawaii's Where the Drone Leads uh, program today. And we were just talking uh, uh, before the break about the, the incredible scale that Chuck just suggested of a program that would have a lot of uh, immediate and long-lasting benefit that could be something explored and tested together and in piece parts in something like the Pan-Pacific uh, Unmanned uh, Aerial System Test Range Complex. In fact, I don't think any of the other test sites could, could, could do that. We have Alaska, we have Oregon, we have you got the whole ocean in between. So Chuck gave us a thought here of uh, taking a, a real challenge, a real challenge, a real step forward here. But um, we'd have to probably start small before we scale up and uh, think of things that would be within that scope that can be done locally here which would be probably uh, airspace integration uh, in the approach and departure domains of something like that. So we'd have, thinking that thing through, we'd have the air traffic situation, we'd have landowners to think about. So a location on the coast that would be on the island coast that has no significant land ownership issues uh, in, an, in an area where there's not a lot of air traffic, sounds like Lanai to me, would be... Uh, what about what about a, what? What if the exchange doesn't actually have to happen on land? What if, what if the what if the airship actually deploys a pod, and then it just gets kind of pulled in by a tug, the rest of the way? A drop in the ocean and then uh, pull it across. A okay, tug. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So there's all kinds of, but this then leads to the other the other issue. There's so much of this opportunity and flexibility in the future. How do we even grab our arms around what can, what's what's a defined uh, potential solution. How do we optimize these really complex potential paths forward and come up with systems that are going to be useful, take advantage of the technology, and not give us any threats? Uh, that's a philosophical discussion. Well, how do we do that? We, we just did it. We just we just put it out there. there. <laughs> Either somebody's yeah. already thought of it, or you know, it's gonna it's gonna happen because that's usually just kind of how things go. Um, I think. So, um, but. I, I, I don't, I'm not really sure I'm the first person that's thought of this. That's the first thing that's pop, popped in my mind um, about, you know, what can I possibly do um, that's, you know, relatively anemic, or not anemic, I shouldn't say, but non-invasive and um, kind of docile um, and, you know, would help out many, many things. And you're, you can test it out over the, probably the most sparsely populated area on the face of the planet. Which so, would be the Pacific Ocean. If you really wanted to put something to the test like that, you'd want to go maybe Lanai, Maui, and back a few times and get you know, you know, deal with all of the uh, different approaches into Kahului. This is a a, a most uh, interesting and most complex uh, thought that, that you suggested to us. So moving from Hawaii to Washington D.C. has has changed the things that go on inside your head, Chuck. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I get exposed to a lot of stuff. Um, I get I, I get exposed to a lot of people making claims that don't seem like they're possible, and uh, but they got cool drawings. Um, I get exposed to a lot of different theory about you know what this stuff could be used for, um, especially in this area, um, especially with a lot of the you know up and coming infrastructure needs and um, inspections. You know, there's there's a lot of a lot of different things that it could be used for here and also with search and rescue. So, you know, kind of going back to the whole issue about, you know, the, the national conversation, social acceptance, if, you know, search and rescue is having an issue with that because of that issue. So, you know, a few positive use cases might, might uh, you know, remedy that. Um, also, if there could be, I, you know, you kind of have to have the mission in place, right? So you don't want to have to have a, a, an aircraft sitting around that's purpose just for an accident, waiting around for an accident. No, that thing needs to be checking the coastline once a day or once every couple of days. And all of that data, you know, looking for any, you know, change detection or object detection or any sort of uh, environmental concern question that might like, so you have to think of multi-purposing these systems so that you do take care of the spreading the investment over a range of potential uh, users or applications, but have it available for disaster or emergency situations 
when and if needed and call upon it, right. kind of like the Civil Air Patrol operates or right. uh, Team Rubicon. Exactly. Right. And, that, you know, we're not talking about aircraft that are, um, you know, uh, a foam plane that I put together and I put a camera in. Actually, we're talking about a real airplane, but not with a, a human in it. That's what you need to be effective and reliable over a large body of water like that. So, so there's rules of scale here that are that we haven't reduced from a philosophical concept to a practice at this point in time. And in fact, I'm going to go back to a point you made earlier about the uh, claims that are made by some people or and organizations as such and the uh, uh, inability to deliver on those claims. You're seeing a lot of that from the ebb and flow of traffic that you see? I have. I, I've, I've seen more than, um, more than I care to. So sure. an interesting role that these uh, that these FAA test sites could play is sorting out those the, the, the truths or consequences of those various claims and act like yep. sort of like an underwriter's laboratory coming up with uh, figures of merit, right. performance measurements and this sort of thing that substantiate yeah, all those metrics. Yep, and then and you and you need some sort of compliance check. So I mean there's <laughs> there's there's already been a standard put in place for image data by the American Society of uh, uh, photogrammetry and remote sensing. So they, people like FEMA go to them and say, for floodplain maps, what should our uh, square air be? And they you know, kind of stay within that, that uh, you know, that, that, that policy or that, that standard. So, um, so the well, ASPERS, well, let me go I'm back to the point. To find now. The ASPERS people have put oh, together standards? Company. Survey companies are actually using the, the technology for surveys and are actually, you know, putting a, a dollar value to it. So that's the first first time that I've seen actually somebody putting any sort of value to the the data and the and and the imagery as well. Yeah, but it, going back, that's not so much social acceptance. Just, that's professional acceptance. Chuck, for a minute, going back, you, I think you mentioned that Aspers is putting together um, standards for photogrammetry from UAVs. Not for UAVs, but for like man for for uh, actual manned aircraft. Okay, and UAVs you know, would follow the same pitch. path, right? Right. And they can't right. deviate. So you know that, it, yeah, it's been difficult in industry for companies, survey companies, engineering engineering companies, to be able to accept that that image that you know products from that imagery because it hasn't gone through any sort of quality control. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, we're going to see the same thing. The company I think on the technical side of the aircraft and aircraft performance, whether it's a helicopter, UAV, I mean, a, a fixed wing, whatever it might be, uh, we're going to see some of those standard issues starting to creep into the design. Uh, the uh, ASTM is beginning to work on standards associated with structure and with uh, performance and uh, oper some operations issues. The RTCA is meeting even next week in Reno. And they're going to be talking about standards in the uh, software side, uh, trusted software, uh, as well as the spectrum and the radio com control aspects. Uh, so there's, we're starting to see motion in those in those areas. Are you paying attention to that sort of thing, which is kind of comes out of Washington D.C.? Are you uh, seeing a lot of that uh, moving from the, the 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 concept and what the need is down to how we actually do it? Um, not so much from a commercial standpoint uh, since I've been in D.C. because I've been, most of the work I've been doing has pr been primarily um, Department of Defense or uh, Navy Special Warfare, um, some, something like that. So they have their own set, you know, mill specs that we have to adhere to, and they're very, very mission specific. So there is a way of going about doing that, but it's for a specific aircraft that's going to do one thing and then its, its mission is over and, and that's it. Um, but what I am seeing from the commercial side is standards within the aircraft's ability to navigate and to collect data um, using either real-time kinematic or post-processing kinematic so that you're not waiting around one of the benefits of this is that you can get the data a lot faster than you normally would from you know conventional methods. So with, by staying within 48 to 60 hour delivery date, what kind of aircraft do I need and what kind of sensor does it need to be carrying in order to get this specific uh, resolution and accuracy of data? And there is a bit of a standard that's starting to develop 
um, around the aircraft type and, and, and what kind of uh, electronics it needs on board to be able to achieve that. That's very good. So that means that the customers are actually beginning to assert what their needs are in some form and they're right. going to work their way back to the manufacturers. Exactly. So, you know, now we're seeing survey companies working with, directly with uh, SenseFly or Seastle, Seastle, uh, which is a Slovenian company, um, working directly with them to get the type of product that they want. And then that company also offers them, you know, six months of support and training and, and the whole ball of wax. Um, but you're not dealing with a four or five thousand dollar aircraft anymore. You're dealing with a thirty, forty thousand dollar aircraft. Chuck, in, in the last two minutes we have here, and it's been a super pleasure having you on again. I can't wait till you're actually here at the table and we can do this face to face. But uh, I, as you may know, I'm signed up to do a, a talk at a conference coming up in May, the GSA conference. That I, you may have had something to do with that. And, I did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, I need a little a couple of clues on what would be the most useful information that that audience would want to would want to take away. Well, you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of connections to the policy component of it. I think people want to know what exactly can I do in the airspace. And a lot of these people are pe data people. They want to use the technology. They don't know how to go about the you know how to enter into using the technology. How to go about getting their 107 license, and frankly, where you know where where they can fly, what the constraints are, so on and, and so forth. So they'll they'll be that, and then you know some of the you know the, the technology components that you're probably getting more and more exposure to in your new new position at UH. <laughs> okay. Like, um, so they're, they're going to be looking for that. They're going to be looking for you for policy and, and trends, let's say. Okay. Well, Chuck, I thank you very much for that insight. That'll allow me to get some work done this weekend, starting to map out what the talk will be all about. And uh, once again, uh, hats off to you for making the transition you made to D.C. and the new things in your life that are going on. And can't wait to see all of you back here. Uh, yeah. Come to our house. Your canoe's still sitting there, ready to be used, uh, along with one the others. Day. It will happen. Okay, sure. man. Chuck, yeah, stay healthy. Thanks a lot. And we'll see you all next week.